Thank you for joining us. With us is Jonathan Schroyer, the Chief CX Officer and MD of Gaming at Arise. How are you doing today? Hey, Ben. I'm doing great. Thanks for the time today. It's great to uh, spend some time and, and talk about these great topics. Yeah, I really appreciate you spending time with us. Well, first thing I want to talk about is you and make sure everybody knows about you. There's so many awards you've won. You've worked at so many companies. <laughs> I, uh, I couldn't even talk about them all. So why don't you give us the highlights of your career and how you got to where you are? Uh, well, I, I think for me, it's it's very simple. Ever since I was you know, 15, 16, I always felt like my purpose in life was to serve and to help. And so I think it was pretty natural that I ended up in a customer service job, my first job in college. Uh, you know, I was helping my folks with Microsoft Excel 97. That ages me a little bit. Yeah. But, and then just throughout my career, I've had service roles. I've gone from, you know, working in tech to working in gaming and doing startup, a lot of entrepreneurial stuff. But all of it's been about like, three main things like how do you help you know the customer get value how do you help the company be successful and then how do you help the people and the community um, increase their overall you know the wealth capability and so i've just been super interested in those three areas throughout my whole career yeah that, that makes it a, a lot of sense and i know uh, we skipped over your awards but i want to highlight them you know you've gotten quite a few really a, a great ones so if you could just list i guess your favorite ones real quick and we'll dive into the rest of it because it's really impressive yeah i mean it's very kind of you so i i guess my favorite one is probably the mahatma gandhi medal of honor uh, that was a very kind honor over the last 20 years i've done a lot of philanthropic work uh, I set up digital literacy centers in India. I brought 20,000 jobs to India back in 2003, 2004. When I lived in the UK, I ran a, an anti-human trafficking NGO there, and I sat on the, the Business Diversity Council for the City of London. Uh, and then when I started Officium, my company that I sold to Arise, in 2019, I had a mission of decentralizing work and decentralizing wealth. And And so I think that being able to have successful business is great, but to have successful community and to help those around you is even better. So I think that's my favorite award. There's been other awards like, uh, you know, I've been on Forbes, you know, I've been on Fortune for a number of awards like CX Professional of the Year and, or, you know, to, uh, I think CIO Today, you know, Top CEO Mind of 2021, a variety of different awards, which are all very kind. Uh, at, at the end of the day, it's it's just great to be in a world where you can take the ideas that you have and work with other people and make an impact. That's that's where my passion is. That's amazing. I can tell you really care about all people, and that's why customer experience really makes sense to you, right? And it ties in. Why don't we dive into that topic a little bit? You know, you've had a lot of different roles, but what would you recommend for the first hundred days of somebody stepping into a CX leadership role? What should they do? It's a pretty simple answer it's two syllables it's listen mm -hmm. you know I, I think that you should go on a listening tour and you should really understand you know how the business is run understand the pain points that people are already feeling and know that they're feeling and even may have a solution that they haven't been able to enact in the past and then once you've listened to everyone and you've had the opportunity to gain that information then bring in your own thought leadership, your own expertise, your own frameworks, however you traditionally run your business, mesh those together in a meaningful way where it feels like that it's being co-created between your own self as the leader and then the rest of the team who gave you this super valuable information. And in doing that, <clears throat> you'll no doubt hear from either customers directly or customers via feedback via your team. And I think if you have that cohesive 360 view of leadership, team, and customer, and you really understand the data and the information, that'll help you think through the strategy, the framework of how to move, move the needle to where you, what everybody wants, I think, is to keep customers happy so they keep coming back, right? Uh -huh. Stickiness, retention. That, that's what I would probably do in my first 100 days. And that's what I've done in my last four jobs in my first 100 <laughs> days is the same exact thing. Yeah, you want to listen, right? A lot of people come in and try to change things and it doesn't go over very well. After those first 100 days, you know, what are you focusing right now on your current uh, customer experience strategy? Well, what I look at is after that first 100 days, I think it's three-prong approach. So I think the first is 
based off of that 100 days, we had a lot of great information. And what strategy and ro roadmap did we decide to build for the next 12 to 18 months? And that's really the, the leadership and the thought mindset of the team internally. Let's build out a roadmap and, and let's start saying, hey, we're going to do these things. Let's not overcommit ourselves. The reality is in 12 to 18 months, you can only do six or seven initiatives. Mm -hmm. at the most right some companies like let's do 20 i'm like okay let's boil the ocean it's not going to work yeah so like find those three to five to six the internal thing. that's the first thing i do the second thing i would do is i would start to do some serious benchmarking in whatever industry you're in so you can really understand not only on the product side which is common but also on the experience side like how does your experience match up with your top competitors with the folks that you're trying to win business from Mm -hmm. Right. Um, when the hearts and the minds. Right. So that second piece is like and it's not just a one time exercise. So benchmarking is like a quarterly or every six months exercise where you stay afoot with with the latest and greatest of what's happening in your particular industry on product and experience. So I think that's the second thing. I think the third thing and the most important thing from my perspective is uh, people do business with people. Right. Um, and so I think that you really have to grow your leaders. Like I always see my job, they say, what's your number one focus in the job? My, I said, my job is to, to build the next generation of leaders. <laughs> we may be selling widgets. We may be doing video games. We may be doing Microsoft Office, whatever it is, it doesn't matter the product. It's like, if you're building a company for longevity, you're building leadership. And mm -hmm. so I think that's the third thing to really think about. Yeah, that allows you to step back as you become, you know, more and yeah. more of a leader. <laughs> you can trust them because of what you built. I want to touch on that benchmarking part. You know, it's great to set benchmarks, but how do you measure success against these benchmarks? Well, I think generally speaking, what I've done in the past is I've identified what are the industry benchmarks? Uh, are they good enough? Are they strong enough? And then what are additional KPIs, metrics or information data sets? that I know from my experience that need to be tracked, right? And then we work as a team to say, okay, what are the top four or five metrics that we think are most important for us to be competitive against the industry? And then what's the one metric, let's call it the North Star, mm -hmm. that is our key leading indicator. And that usually is some form of, uh, if you're in video games, maybe it's uh, revenue uh, per day. If you're in SaaS, maybe it's, you know, stickiness and renewal per month, but usually it's something around lifetime value. Mm -hmm. you, you know, what's the metric that you use to drive the lifetime value of your client, right? And so you'll have those four or five sub KPIs or sub metrics, right, that you'll keep monitoring. But really it's about like, is your, is your stickiness going up? Is your LTV going up? If it is, great. If not, why? And what do you need to experiment mm -hmm. to, to get it to go up? Because in some cases, the industry benchmarks will not give you the information to get to drive better stickiness because perhaps the rest of the industry doesn't know. Um, and so, so I think in some cases you have to think about that outside the box, but in some cases it's good to get a baseline of like inside the box, where are you at and how are you com competing? Um, Cause then you can then take it to the next level and go outside the box and be the industry leader. Yeah, that, that sounds like a great approach, but I'm sure there's some difficult parts to it, right? What are the pain points you have when you take that type of approach? Well, I think generally the the other side of people doing business with people is people don't like change. Yeah. Traditionally. Yeah. I um, mean, you know, what is it? 80 to 85 percent of the population doesn't doesn't do well with change. You have like 10 to 15 percent are like, let's change. Let's go. And the rest yeah. of them are like, no, let's not do that. Let's be comfortable. Let's be secure. And I think it depends, obviously, the size of your company. If you're a smaller company, there's probably more people uh, than a l larger company, less people want to change. And so I think the biggest thing is, you know, going back to the winning the hearts and the minds of your customers, where you got to win the hearts and your minds of your people first, right? Absolutely. So I, I always say your 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 people or your the heart of your company, right? And your customer is the lifeblood. Mm -hmm. And so you got to you got to take care of the heart. You got to get the heart, you know, bought into it, committed to it, interested in it passionate about it and then if you can if you're able to solve that then it's going to be a lot easier to then do all the other things that you need to do to be a leader if you can't get your team bought into it or your team isn't interested in it you either have to change your team or you have to figure out different strategies to help your team come along the ways or slow it down 
sometimes people want to do cool things they just don't want to do it so fast Mm -hmm. like the what i see which is really i don't want to use the word dangerous but it's not helpful is when people come in and they want to move so fast that they're not taking into account the mental and the emotional toll that change has on people who aren't used to change and so i think you have to be very thoughtful like hey if we're going to like go from point A to point B, and we're going to do it in one second versus 60 seconds, there's going to be a lot of problems that are going to come up in that one second because people are not going to be ready to move that fast. Mm -hmm. And so I think you have to be thoughtful of your culture as well and have patience and time. Like when I, when I buy a new business, I always, you know, the, these owners I'm buying from, they're like, well, how fast are we going to do this? Are we going to do that? We didn't, you know, they're like sensitive and they want to do growth, but they're sensitive to changing the ways and you have to be like, OK, well, this is like a two year journey or this is a five year or this is a seven year journey. Right. Where companies, especially public companies, get stuck in the cycle of like revenue this quarter. Yeah. What's our goal? We didn't hit our goal. Like, and so they're making these decisions that are jumping over dimes of value to get to pennies of revenue or pennies of savings. Right. And that's a very short term mindset. And so you see companies that are in that short term mindset don't tend to last very long. That makes a lot of sense. You talked about getting your team to buy in, but how do you get the leadership, the C-suite to buy in? From my perspective, you you have to talk to them in their own language. And what I mean by that, so when I started Officium, I created something called the Service Tech Maturity Model. And the essence of the model was, I was like, hey, I've been building CX teams my whole life, but I've never built the framework on what makes my thing successful, right? So I built the framework and the framework is great for the CX team because they're like, yeah, yeah, we got to do this. And this is the next feature in the framework. And this is, yeah, this all makes sense. Let's go do. And then you have the exit executives being like, why do I want to spend money to do that? Yeah. So what I, what I was like, okay, so what I have to do is I have to take this framework that's going to work really well with the CX workers and the leaders and say, okay, How do we translate that to a value statement or a value metric for the executives? And that's where the LTV thing comes. Uh So it's usually lifetime value, optimization. Those are the two key things or some type of satisfaction metric of some 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 suites like satisfaction. Not all of us, some do. Uh So you're basically looking at revenue and finance, right? Those are the two. Those are usually the power cores. Sometimes you have a power core that's IT or tech, but you know, usually it's revenue finance, in some cases product. Um, and so if you're if revenue, great, then LTV works well. If it's finance, great, LTV plus optimization, savings, it's gonna happen by, Im- by implementing these things. Mm-hmm. If it happens to be product, great, let me show you how to, get, how to get more sticky customers, how to decrease the amount of barriers that you're putting in front of them that you're not even paying attention that you're putting in front of them because you're not looking at the customer journey to understand it completely. But but with my service tech, I can help you do that. So invest some money to do that. So it's really just talking about like, what are the things that are going to resonate with them and talk to them about that. And then talk to the rest of your team about all the stuff in this, in the, in, that's going to resonate with them. And just say, hey, as a leader, I got to talk to the folks about this. So just know I'm going to be talking to them about this, but this is the, this is the stuff, right? Mm-hmm. And I think if you're honest and transparent, it works. You just got to yeah. make sure you're honest and transparent. I love how you're, you're speaking their language, right? That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. You got to handle each entity a little bit differently. Do you have a specific example of where you've used customer feedback to improve a business? Yeah, I mean, 100. Uh, so I was working with a client in the video game space and you know they their service le- levels were like nine days, which for anyone listening, nine days is a very long time to respond yeah. to a customer. Uh, their CSAT was 39%. Uh, in general, what I found is like they just they didn't they weren't set up on the process side and on the scalable people side to be able to to listen to their customers at all. They were just, you know, whack a mole right? Uh-huh. And, and so what we did is we came in, we set up the maturity model and a key part of the maturity model is customer feedback, customer listening system, customer satisfaction, and those types of things. And so we set up a process where we would quickly identify this is the star CSAT system, so one one to five stars. We quickly identify anybody that gave two stars or less, put them into a proactive queue that, that we, we would then immediately go back and reach out to those customers uh-huh. and say, okay, what, did, what didn't work? What was the challenge? What was the problem? So that was the first thing. The second thing we did 
was we we looked globally and we turned the organization to a follow the sun model, uh, which means that 24 hour coverage. So service levels went from nine days to one hour, right? So that's the second oh, thing we did. The, the third thing we did is we worked with the product team and we identified which players um, were had stopped playing the game when they had stopped playing the game and why. Um, and so then we identified ways to communicate and proactively reach back up out to those players and win them back. And based off of their feedback, incentivize them, compensate them in a certain way to help them feel good about coming back into the game and so forth. So all in all, we ended up protecting $7 million of additional revenue, optimizing $2 million out of the business. So $9 million of total um, value to the business. And the cost you know, was in the 3 to $4 million range, right? So wow. it, at first, like the executive might have been like, oh, that's a lot of money. But at the end, they were very happy, right? They yeah. got into it because they believed in it. And I think that's a great example of when you believe in it and you listen, then you can actually make an enormous amount of value and impact to the business. Yeah, absolutely. Let's let's talk more about that, right? You can make a lot of value impact to the business. What do you think the future of CX is and what do you think, you know, 5, 10, 15 years you'll be able to provide that value? Well, I think what's, what's going to be interesting is the future, in my opinion, is we're going to change from being CX leaders and customer service agents to CX visionaries and customer service architects. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is I believe that if we really embrace AI and we really embrace the large language models, what it can do is, is it can turn our agents into architects. So rather than being the people that write the responses, they're architecting it every experience that they have. So a bot can write 90% of the response, right? And they can look it over and review it and so forth. And that's great. But then they can architect, well, how do I customize this further? How do I make this more meaningful? How do I engage this customer, architect this experience with this particular customer so I know that they're going to come back? And so I, and then the CX visionaries, instead of just instead of being leaders, because those architects are going to be leaders in their own right, right? Mm -hmm. um, so instead of being CX leaders, you're going to be visionaries, and you're going to be thinking, like, oh, if I have my 50 architects working, what are they designing now that I need to enable for the future to deliver even a more amazing experience, more yeah. stickiness, more, more innovation, right? And so I think that's that's my viewpoint on how things are going to change. And it might be that these customer service agents end up getting like $70,000 a year now instead of 30,000 mm -hmm. in the US I'm using US stuff. Yeah. Um, it's, but, but I mean, it could, it'll, it's gonna be an interesting future, but I think companies that really embrace the architect mentality are gonna see a huge difference in the way that their customers feel about them. Yeah, it, I mean, it seems like it would free up more time. So you'd have fewer yeah. people doing more work, which, you know, is a great place to be in any any capacity in your business. Uh, yeah. Got a couple more questions for you. I know you got a hard stop here. So, you know, what else should we know about you and how can we get in contact with you? Uh, so I'm really passionate about coaching, mentoring, leadership, entrepreneurship. I invest in businesses. I mentor and advise businesses to scale and grow. My, I'm... I own the Chief CX Officer brand, so you can go to chiefcxofficer.com. You can go to all the socials and look at at Chief CX Officer, and you'll find me. And then I'm on, I'm on LinkedIn as well, so Chief mm -hmm. CX Officer there too. So that's the best way to, to reach out to me. Yeah, that's how I got in contact with you. It worked great. So definitely give that one a, a good recommendation. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much for uh, sharing your knowledge. We really appreciate it, and it's been great chatting with you. Uh, thanks, Ben, and thanks to listeners for listening. Have a great day, mate. You too.